occasionally I do want to change the order of something for a, a, a reason or a purpose. So we're going to hold one second on the, the scripture reading. Um, this morning, uh, as I was, was coming in, Kyle was tracking me down. And, you know, Kyle helps organize our breakfast every uh, morning at, on Sunday mornings here. And most of you who come in, you, you know how that works. There's always a great breakfast there. And there's a little basket to make a contribution to that. And, and he said, you know, it was really kind of bothering him about the, the tornado and the effects in um, in uh, Bridge Creek particularly, and he wondered if the offering at the table there for breakfast could go to, to help out there. And as you, you probably know, his big sis, Maggie, teaches in Bridge Creek, and so we thought we would just, that collection that would be there this morning, uh, we would pass on to her to be able to use in whatever way she sees fit in, in there or to pass on to another organization who's working there. But uh, so, it, you know, it's, it's more than what our usual breakfast offering is, but uh, it's not a huge amount. But if you'd want to uh, help contribute toward that, uh, toward the relief efforts that are going to be going on in Bridge Creek, you can uh, mark a, a check for that purpose and your uh, offering as we do that this morning. But Maggie, would you take this to, just as a, a token of our appreciation and um, to help out there in, in Bridge Creek. So, thank you. Our scripture lesson this, mor this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John. This is the scripture immediately following our verse last Sunday about uh, the vine and the branches. And here, uh, Jesus is instructing them in a similar way about the love that he brings to them, which is the love from God the Father, which flows from God through him to the disciples and then to the world. Listen for God's word for you. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, so abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that, you may, uh, so that, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one is greater, has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and to bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. And I am giving you this, these commandments so that you may love one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I suspect you probably, many of you, I, I, over half of you, I bet, probably checked in on Facebook this morning to kind of see what was going on in the world. It's become a part of our uh, regular routine to kind of understand what uh, is going on in, in life and to celebrate it. And, and I know I checked in to see what you all guys are doing, who's selling what in the Chickasha you know, page, and uh, who, you know, who is celebrating Mother's Day already, and gone to visit and survive the tornadoes, and all those kinds of things. It's, it's kind of great to be able to keep up with each other, and, and that's, that's really the, the fun side of, of, of social media, is that we're able to do that. Uh, already this morning from Africa, Anne has posted a picture of Angie and, and her and Thomas together when they were real little, and that was really neat to see, kind of a reminder. And, and you know, we just get, get these little ways that we get to connect with each other and to, to stay socially connected. And, and that's a great thing. But I think there can be also a downside to, to social media. You, you've probably seen it before. There are lots of them. Maybe overexposure. Maybe we uh, put too much about ourselves out there. But I think one of the dangers 
of social media is that it becomes a, a way of maybe judging ourselves in comparison to others. We put out on social media, most of us anyway, the things that are best in our life, things that are good and going well. We put out a, a, maybe a, an image of ourselves uh, that's not completely the whole picture. Because most of us, although some people want to share way too much of the struggle that are going on in their lives, but most of us don't put the difficult parts of our life out there. We put the great things. We put the vacation pictures, you know? And so if we always are looking and our friends are always somewhere exotic around the world, um, we can begin to think of ourselves as maybe less than we should in comparison. Or we begin to move to where we feel like we've got to boost ourselves up somehow by our views. Did you know I had one post not too long ago, had almost 100 likes in it, you know? But then it was followed up by one that had four. So, uh, I mean, does that, where does that put me on my social ranking? Am I doing well or am I doing bad? I'm not sure. Um, we, we tend to value ourselves sometimes by that. What's interestingly uh, interesting to me is that for people roughly around my age or so, uh, late 40s, um, you know, the, and younger, it, it's, some things are almost as if they didn't happen until they've been shared on social media. The, you go and have a great experience and it's all been good, but that's only half the experience. Wait a minute, we've got to share it out there for next. And, and then once it's been shared, then it's really happened, okay? Socially complete at that moment. And then, you know, the full experience comes around. We want to do that. We want to share our lives, and that's a, a great thing. Until it begins to be the way we judge our sense of value and our sense of worth. The picture of me that you'll get from looking at social media will usually be the, the things that I'm most excited about. But you, you won't see me anyway share the places of pain in my life out there on social media. It's just not the way I operate. I tend to hold those things back. And so it becomes an inaccurate picture of, of me. I suspect that's true for you in one way or another in terms of, of how you choose to use it. And it's a tool, it's a good tool. I'm not against Facebook. You know, Facebook actually got started on one college campus. Do you remember that? Harvard University. It was started as kind of an elite thing. It was spread then to Ivy League colleges around the Boston area. Only those who were invited, and you could only get in if you went to one of those high private institutions in the Ivy League. The real branch out was whenever they invited the West Coast Ivy League, uh, Stanford, to join. And when Stanford joined, then it became a kind of a symbol that this was larger than just that. Pretty soon it worked its way down to even me and you, and we got to join up. But it was about that social status that um, one was a part of an elite group. Now you just have to be 13, and you can be on Facebook. How is it that we judge our sense of value, our value in our lives? There are lots of ways we do. I, one, one way we, we judge that is in sports. I love athletics. I love sports. I love to compete. Mostly I like winning. I like to win. Um, and that's, a, you know, it, some of the skills in my life that I've gained through the competition of sports, I would have never gained any other way. Uh, learning to lose even becomes a, an important value in our life. I learned that one yesterday, unfortunately. You know, some of you have been watching on social media. I shared you a picture of our, our dog, Floyd, who we've been taking to different shows. He's an Italian greyhound. You know, it's a small breed, little bitty guy. But he's ranked in the top 25 dogs, at, uh, Italian greyhounds in the country right now. But the problem is, they only publish the top 20 so we're outside of where you get published. So we're really working hard to see if we can bust into that top 20, you know. And uh, it, 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 I, I understand, I understand. Angie loves that dog like crazy, like it's the third child in our family. And you couldn't replace that for anything, whether, you know, 200th or in the top 20. But... Um, you know, there's this me side that likes to compete, and I'm working hard to see if we can get in there. Well, the number one Italian greyhound in the country was in our part of Neck of the Woods. 
So yesterday morning, we drove down to Denton, Texas, and we were in the show there. We got second place, you know. We didn't beat the dog. No, I, I, I you're misunderstanding. You're misunderstanding. We lost. That was, that's the point. We lost. It doesn't matter that it's a cousin of ours, you know, that happens to be the top-ranked dog in the country. It does, that doesn't matter that it's family. It's, uh, we lost, you know. That was our big chance to make a name for ourselves, and we missed it, at least this time around. We, we, we judge our sense of value in silly ways, in silly ways. Um, Jesus came to teach us another way. He came, came to teach us a totally different way of living. It's not where we judge our worth or our value by where we're ranked or how many likes we have in social media. It's where we learn to judge our value by something much deeper than that. We learn to judge our value by something deeper than the job we hold, the grade we make in school. We learn to judge our value by something that's far more fundamental. In fact, it relates in a way kind of to this day we celebrate as Mother's Day. If there's ever any human love that's, that's as close to God's love for us, it's got to be the love of a mother, doesn't it? A universal love, a love that is intended to be given unconditionally to us in life. A mother's love that is there for us to help us in our times of difficulty. And most of us experience that. We experience that in the relationships with our, with our mothers. And that is the thing that holds us and gets us through. Not all mothers are perfect. Gosh, we all know that, right? But it's that kind of unconditional love that's there and can be counted on and supported in support for us that we, we come to celebrate this day in our mothers, but also in who God is for us. Even when moms have failed us, God is still there. God is the one who gives us the ultimate and unconditional sense of our value and our worth. If you ever wonder if you're loved or not, just ask God. Because God is the one who is there for you and says no matter how messed up things get in your life, I will always, always be there for you. It's an unconditional love that we can turn to at any point in our lives when we need it. God's love for us is like that. Jesus came to show us that love. And, and he understands that we are sometimes so hard-headed in understanding it that whenever we're reading through the, the Gospel of John, he has to say it over and over and over again. We're all the way now in that scripture into the 16th chapter, only a few more chapters. You can tell we're starting to get to the end of it. He says, I don't call you servants anymore. I'm calling you friends. You can tell he's beginning to turn the conversation because it's not just him as teacher. He it knows that he's going to be moving on. He is going to be leaving them, and they're going to be the ones who are going to pick this up and carry it on. They need to know this now, so it's no longer my servants or no longer my students, but you are my friends, my friends. And he's saying, this is the commandment. Remember it, love one another. How many times do we have to hear it? Lean in close. I want to give you this secret. Love one another. That's what it is. It's the simplest thing that we know in our lives. It's the most basic foundational element of life is to know that kind of unconditional love that is there for us. And yet, we have to work on that lesson over and over again because it's a love that we have to know we are so deeply planted and grounded in that it becomes then the way of our life and living with each other. It then begins to shape how we live in our relationships with one another, how we show love in our families, how we show love in the community of the church, how we show love when we're driving down 4th Street and someone cuts in front of us. It's how we show love as the foundational part of our life, not 
pettiness, not anger, not bitterness, not keeping score, but letting love be the guiding force of our lives and not pulled aside or distracted or distracted by it in any other way. Letting love be the one motivation of who we are. It's a hard lesson to truly know fully and deeply. It's one we have to regain a sense of perspective about. We have to revisit it. Maybe that's why we come back every Sunday, isn't it? To just reacquaint ourselves with that love that we have, that God has for us, by coming and being in the presence of God and reminding ourselves, he's there for me. And I don't have to ever wonder or doubt that in my life. There's no other thing that so shapes who we are. Now, I, I don't time out my sermons, so I don't really know how long they are. I have a sense of when they get long, too long. I, you guys let me know that usually. They start to nod off, or no one's mean out there saying, hey, cut it, you know. But, um, but I, I wanna share, and this may mean that the, the sermon's a little shorter today, and if it is, just spend a little extra time showing love to those who are in your life and especially to your, to your moms. But maybe in trying to think and be like Jesus was with the disciples of asking them to lean in close and to hear God's love, maybe I can take you back to a place uh, like childhood. Maybe I can take you back and this can be for you. Maybe just imagine that this is is, is your mom reading a story to you as a child? Now, we didn't get everything right as parents, I promise you. But one of the things we did get right is that almost every night, nearly every night, Angie and I would take the kids to bed, and when we'd tuck them in, and we didn't let them sleep with us. Kids didn't sleep in our bed. That was never how we did it. Kids always slept in their, their own beds. Took them to their, their beds. Angie to one, me to the other, and we would read a story with the kids every night before they went to bed. And this story is one that's called uh, You Are Special by Max Licato. And I wanna read it to you this morning. This may be, you may think, oh, I went to church and the preacher read a book, you know. You could either act that way about it or you can let yourself become the child again and hear this story, which is for you. The Wemix were a small wooden people, and all of the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. His wood shop sat on a hill overlooking their village. Each Wemix was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes. Some were tall and others were short. Some wore hats, others wore coats, but all were made by the same carver and all lived in the village. And all day, <clears throat> every day, the Wemix did the same thing. They gave each other stickers. Each Wemix had a box of gold star stickers and a box of gray dot stickers. Up and down the street, all over the city, people spent their day sticking stars or dots on one another. The pretty ones with smooth wood and with fine paint, they got stars. But those, if the wood was rough or the paint was chipped, the Wemix would give them a dot. Something like a like on your social media page, maybe. The talented ones got Stars, too. Some could lift big sticks high above their heads or jump over tall boxes. Still others knew big words or could sing pretty songs, and everyone gave them stars. Some Wemix had stars all over them. Every time they got a star, it made them feel so good, and it made them want to do something else to get a star. Others, though, could do little, and they got dots. Punchinello, oh, I gotta change the page, don't I? Punchinello was one of those. He tried to jump high like others, 
but he always fell. And when he fell, others would gather around and give him a dot. Sometimes he, uh, when he fell, his wood got scratched, and so people would give him more dots. Then, when he tried to explain why he fell, he would say something silly, and the Wemix would still give him more dots. After a while, he had so many dots that he didn't want to go outside. He was afraid he would do something dumb, such as forget his hat or step into the water, and then people would give him another dot. In fact, he had so many gray dots that some people would come up to him and give him for no other reason than that. He deserves a lot of dots, the wooden people would agree with one another. He's not a good wooden person. After a while, Punchinello believed them. I'm not a good weemick, he would say. And a few times he went outside, he hung around with other weemicks who had lots of dots, and then he would feel better. And one day, he met a weemick who was unlike any other he had seen. He, uh, she had no dots or stars. She was just wooden. Her name was Lucia. It wasn't that people didn't try to give her stickers. It's just that the stickers didn't stick. Some of the Wemix admired her for having no dots, and so they would run up to her and give her a star, but it would fall off. Others would look down on her for having no stars, and so they would try to give her a dot, but it would not stick either. That's the way I want to be, thought Punchinello. I don't want anyone's marks. So he asked the stickerless Wemick how she did it. It's easy, Lucia replied. Every day I go see Eli. Eli? Yes, Eli, the woodcarver. I sit in the workshop with him. Why? Why don't you go find out for yourself? Go up the hill. He's there. And with that, the Wemick, who had no stickers, turned and skipped away. But will he want to see me, Punchinello cried out, but Lucia didn't hear. So Punchinello went home, and he sat near a window, and he watched the wooden people as they scurried around, giving each other stars and dots. It's not right, he muttered to himself, and he decided to go see Eli. He walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill, and he stepped into the big shop. His wooden eyes widened at the size of everything. The stool was as tall as he was. He had to stretch to his tiptoes to see the top of the wooden bench. A hammer was as long as his arm, and Punchinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here, and he turned to leave. Then he heard his name. Punchinello, the voice was deep and strong. Punchinello stopped. Punchinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Punchinello turned slowly, and he looked at the large bearded craftsman. You know my name? The little Wemick asked. Of course I do. I made you. Eli stooped down and picked up and picked him up and set him on the bench. Hmm, the maker spoke thoughtfully as though he had looked at the gray dots. Looks like you have been given some bad marks. I didn't mean to, Eli. I really try hard. Oh, you, don't, you do not have to defend yourself with me, child. I don't care what the other we makes think. You don't? No, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give stars or dots? They're Wemix just like you. What they think does not matter, Punchinello. All that matters is, that, is what I think, and I think you are pretty special. Punchinello laughed. Me, special, why? I can't walk fast, I can't jump. 
my paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli looked at Punchinello, put his hands on the, the small wooden shoulders and spoke very softly. Because you're mine. That's why you matter to me. Punchinello had never had anyone look at him this way, much less his maker. And he didn't know what to say. Every day, I've been hoping that you would come, Eli explained. I came because I met someone who had no marks, said Punchinello. I know. She has told me about you. Why don't the sticker stay on her? The maker sp spoke softly. Because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What, he said? The stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you will care about their stickers. I'm not sure I understand. Eli smiled. You will, but it will take time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come and see me every day. And let me remind you how much I care about you. Eli lifted Punchinello off the bench and he set him on the ground. Remember, Eli said to the Weemick walking out the door, you are special because I made you, and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, I think he really means it. And when he did, a dot fell to the ground. Each of us, we want to be free, but we live as though it's the world that decides what our ultimate value is. We want to be free of that. We don't want that to decide our value. And so we're here. We're making our trip up the hill to visit our maker and to remember who we are and how greatly he loves us so that we can be free of all of that. This morning... Maybe as you go, maybe you will feel the dots fall away. Maybe you'll feel the stars be lifted so that you can ultimately and truly know the full love and full grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord.